Do you feel stuck, stalled in place in your life, faith, or relationship with God? Have you been trapped in unhealthy patterns? Are you curious why certain situations trigger you? Have you ever felt anxiety or depression that no matter how hard you tried, you just couldn't seem to shake it? Well, for years I felt stuck. I wasn't sure why I had grown up in church, read and memorized scripture, worshiped, read self-help books, studied psychology, and gone to years of counseling, and I still didn't feel free. What I didn't fully understand during that time was that so much of a person's thinking and decisions are not controlled in the conscious mind. A lot of what we do is because of subconscious belief and regularly reinforced patterns of thinking and behaving. Those things are deeply ingrained, and we often find ourselves living out of those instinctual beliefs, feeling helpless to live differently. Through Jesus, we're made new, but there still might be residual beliefs, lies, or patterns of thinking and behaving that linger in the depths of the heart. My name's Tasha, and I'm here to offer some of what God has done in my life that's brought a tremendous amount of freedom. There have been parts of my heart with invisible wounds that held me back from the truth I wanted to believe about God's promises and His character and the influence of those on my everyday life. Those wounds affected the way I saw the world, myself, God, everything. I wanted to know that the freedom I read about in Scripture could actually be attained. And God has brought about that real change in me, the kind I never thought I would experience. I say all the time, I felt bound most of my life, and now I feel like the freest person I know, and it's amazing. Boundless is meant to facilitate a process of prayer that moves freedom from your head to your heart. My hope is that during this series, you experience God's presence in a way that brings freedom to your life. Healing can only come from God Himself, and so my prayer is that you connect with Him in a way that heals, that He would somehow use my story and the stories of others to help facilitate your own journey. During this series, some of the folks with me here today are going to share some of their reflections. We're going to read, journal, pray, and reflect. John 16, 13 says that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. So during our time together, it's my hope that you'll come to recognize the truth God wants to move from your head to your heart, and that each of you would know that you are a masterpiece in God's eyes. Just as an artist thoughtfully applies their gifts in the process of creating a work of art, we have been lovingly created by God the Father. A masterpiece is who God says we really are. We'll come back to this idea, but first I want to share a story with you. I grew up in a Christian home uh, out in the middle of nowhere. We had a volunteer fire station and a flashing light in the town where I was from. And the flashing light wasn't technically ours, but we claimed it. Uh, but you know, my parents, uh, they would have done anything for anybody. And they took us to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. Um, but what I knew of God and religion was a hard pew frilly socks that itch because I'm a child of the 80s, and being told to be quiet. That's what I knew of God. And when I was eight or nine years old, we moved to a church, and a different church, and I walked in, and I was so taken back. I felt the presence of God for the first time. They were worshiping. They were raising their hands. They were singing. It was beautiful, and it was the first time that I felt like God was real to me. And so I became really passionate for God. I, I went to the youth group, and I went on youth missions trips, and I joined the youth worship team. I was there every time the doors were open. I was there every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but I was there for a different reason. I was there because I was hungry, not just because someone was taking me. I was at every Tuesday night prayer meeting, and I think I was the only one without a hearing aid. Uh, but I, I loved being at the church. I love knowing more about God. I was just hungry for God. I remember coming home from school and I would just pray and read my Bible at, at 10 or 11 years old. And so that made it all the more painful when I was really wounded in church. It was by a church leader and it was so painful that, you know, my family left the church. I left the church. My family still hasn't really gone back. Um, that church split. 
uh, some people from that church moved to other churches and those churches split. It was just really toxic. And I didn't have the tools to process what was happening. And so around this time, I was maybe 17, 18 years old, starting college. And I started out as a music major because I thought, I want to serve God in music. But then uh, I was so hurt by everything in the church, and I stepped away from the church, and I felt like uh, I was in such a hard place. And Music Theory 4 was so hard <laughs> that I dropped out I, I dropped out of my music major, changed my major to religion, and I went searching. Uh, I didn't study Christianity. I studied Eastern religions, and I went to Buddhist meditation camp. Um, I went to synagogue. I went to mosque. I studied mysticism in Europe for a couple summers. I did everything I could do because I was hurting and I was searching. I wanted to know that I believed what I believed, not because someone told me to believe that or not because of any kind of emotional high. I wanted to know that it was truth, and so I thought all truth is God's truth. If I keep looking, I'll find it. And that road was much more difficult than I thought. It was very isolating and I was so depressed. And at my lowest of low, I tried to commit suicide. And anybody who knows me now would never think that because I love life, I love people, I love myself, I love God, I'm happy, you know? But it was at that lowest of low that I realized in all these other religions, you're striving to reach God. You're striving to reach enlightenment, to be good enough. Uh, even in the religious spirit of Christianity, you're trying to be good enough. You're trying to earn God's grace. And I had been striving for so long. And in that place, I realized something that in the gospel, not in religion, in the gospel, Jesus is in pursuit of me. And that shifted something in my mind. And I thought, you know what? This is different. This is a kingdom of opposites. It's better to give than to receive. To gain your life, you have to lose it. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Something about it triggered something for me. And I thought, this is not a God who is lofty and, and unreachable. This is Emmanuel, God with us. He lowered himself to reach me. And so that humility drew me in. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to force myself to go back to church. I didn't feel anything. I just thought I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight, not by my emotions. And I'm just going to go because I need something to stick because I've tried everything else. I don't have any other options. And so I went for a whole year. I didn't feel anything. I was still numb. Uh, kind of hated going some weeks, but I just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And about a year in, the pastor said, if you want to touch from God, why don't you come up at the end of the service and we want to pray for you. And I was the first one up and I left three hours later. I was a sobbing mess on the ground. And I make this joke every time I tell this story that they probably had to replace that square of carpet because of all my snot. Because I just lost it. I was, I felt again for the first time. And for someone who had been walking through depression and feeling numb for so long, to feel again was a big deal. And so that was an alter moment in my life. It changed the trajectory of things. Uh, I had a lot of healing left to go, but I ended up remembering the call of God on my life when I was 13 at a youth conference. And I went to seminary. I, I lived out in California and I worked as a worship pastor. I ended up doing... Uh, American Idol, which I'd never said I would do a show like that. I said I would never do that. And then I ended up singing for Katy Perry for four years as a background vocalist. And on the outside, people would look at my life and think, oh man, she's, she's doing great. Like, you know, she has the ministry side that she's doing, and then she's got a career on, on this other side. And, but I was crumbling inside. I still felt stuck. I wasn't sure how all of these good things were happening on the outside, and I still felt like I was that person in my college dorm room ready to take my life. And so I packed up everything. I quit everything, and I packed up everything, and I moved back to my parents' house in South Carolina, and I thought, I'm going to do a sabbatical. I'm going to go on sabbatical. And being the type A person that I am, I thought, I'm going to do this sabbatical better than anybody's ever done sabbatical. <laughs> so I get all these books on sabbatical, and I read through And by the end of three weeks, I am exhausted. I'm like, I cannot sabbatical. How do people do this? <laughs> um, and so I was sitting on my parents' porch with either coffee or sweet tea in my hand, 
on the porch swing and I thought, I can't do this alone. I don't know how to get out of this place. I don't know even how to find the roots of what's going on in my heart. And so I decided to go somewhere in Colorado that uh, I hoped would help me. I prayed it would help me. I was so scared that it wouldn't, but it did. It was a beautiful place, an intensive counseling center where I learned how to dig up the roots of where things started in my life and how to process those and how to let the Holy Spirit come into that moment and heal. And He can heal in an instant what we try to do for years, what we work at to heal and and process for years. He can do it in an instant. And so that's what Boundless is about. So my question for you today is where do you feel stuck in your journey? I get really stuck with people pleasing. Mm. And every time I think I'm over it, there's like another person that's like, oh, I got to please you now. Yeah. So. And have you ever thought about where that started in your life? Not until now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was a huge part of my journey too, is I just, I was so worried about what people would think. And I think that was a religious thing. And the fact that I grew up kind of being teased and bullied. And uh, I just wanted to present a self that wasn't going to be rejected. And so I start self-protecting, but in that self-protection, I also, uh, I might keep myself safe from the hurt, but I'm also keeping myself from joy and from the good. And there's a scripture that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think in our lives, when we have that fear of man, of trying to please them and worrying about what they think, uh, it's such a hard place to be in. And we, we lack the wisdom that God wants to give us from fearing Him instead of man. That's a really good one. I grew up seeing the pictures of Jesus with the, the children and, you know, all these children were, you know, just hugging Him and touching Him and, 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 you know, just having this relationship. And for me, I couldn't picture, I felt like I was always hiding behind a tree. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't, I didn't see a child with a disability or I didn't see a child that, you know, was bleeding and hurt. And for me, I had to, I just felt like I was always hiding behind a tree. I couldn't go to Jesus and allow him to touch me and, yeah. and to, to receive that. So, like as a broken person, you weren't worth him holding you absolutely. and touching you. Yeah. And I think sometimes we think that we are whole. And as you know, a Christian, if we've grown up in the church our whole life, we have this uh, air about us that, you know, we're good, we're good, we got Jesus, you know, all that. And yet sometimes inside there can be a very uh, small sliver of our heart that feels broken and it, it holds us back from intimacy with God. In Genesis, intimacy and worship was just being exposed and yet unashamed before God and other people. And I think when we feel broken, we don't want to expose ourselves in any way. We don't want to be vulnerable. And we definitely feel shame. I'm sure you felt shame from feeling broken. And that's not what God wants us to feel. That's not who we are. That's not who He made us to be. And so the point is to get back to Eden and who He made us to be. Who else? Where do you, where do you feel stuck? When it comes to parenting, I find myself talking to my children in a way that I don't want to talk to them. And I go back and I ask forgiveness. And my son, when he was really young, said, I forgive you, mom, but this happens so often. Oh, and I felt, you know, I was grateful that he forgave yeah. me, but I thought it's so sad that I can't break out of it. Um, I just get really critical. And I, I yeah. seem to do the very things that were done to me that I didn't particularly enjoy as a kid. Yeah. So why do I keep doing the things that I didn't like? I don't understand. Yeah. And I think one thing that the Lord did in my heart in Colorado and through this process was that I realized I was treating other people the way I was treating myself inside. When I was being critical of other people, it's because I was being critical of myself. And when I got a revelation of who I was, and how much God loved me, I started smiling at strangers in the airport. I started doing all kinds of things that I wasn't used to doing because I, I saw them as so valuable because all of a sudden I, I recognized my own value and worth. 
And especially as a mom, I think we, I think we're with you. Those of us who are moms, it's, you can have so much guilt and shame surrounding, uh, you know, the way we treat our kids when we're tired or when we're maxed out. I said something to my two year old. I don't even remember what I said to her. She's, she's a firecracker, you guys, but she said, you can't talk to me like that. <laughs> she called me out at two years old. And so, uh, children are honest and they'll definitely let you know. But all that to say, um, I think often we treat others the way we're treating ourselves inside. I think sometimes when you look in a mirror and you look at who you are, there was a point where I just looked like the glass was so broken. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it. I couldn't see myself because the pieces were so broken yeah. that it was distorted. And then it came to a point where it was like one piece at a time. God had to, you know, speak that truth into my life and allow that mirror, you know, that that reflection not to be that broken piece, but yeah. to 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 be fixed so that I could start picturing and seeing myself clearly as God saw me. I love that quote about uh, broken things. The cracks are where the light gets in. And I think when we're honest with God and with ourselves, that light can come into those places and bring healing that we never even anticipated. Uh, but it's so hard to get to that place where you're, you're willing to be vulnerable. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. That word masterpiece comes from a Greek word, poema. It's the word we get poem from. And when you get down to the heart of that word, it's essentially masterpiece, which means an artist's crowning achievement, a work of art they're proud of and known for. We may know in our head that we're God's children and we're His masterpiece, but how do we help that sink into our deeply held beliefs? If you're like me, this is where you feel stuck. And sometimes where truth is just a concept in our heads and not felt or lived out every day. The boundless process is simply an intentional prayer practice that helps you, number one, identify past wounds. Number two, recognize the lies and vows that have subconsciously grown from those wounds. And number three, surrender those to Jesus in exchange for healing and truth. I want to ask you all with me here today, how have you struggled to know and believe that you're God's masterpiece? I think I struggled with self-worth for so many years. I didn't even know what being a masterpiece meant. I, I never even, it was so foreign to me. I couldn't even fathom feeling like I was a masterpiece. I think for me, oftentimes growing up in a Christian family, it feels like thinking that you're a masterpiece is really close to pride. Mm. And we don't want to be prideful. And then as a mom, when you have a girl and you see her and you truly feel like she's a masterpiece, it, it, that feeling isn't even close to pride. So that's, it's, it's hard being a Christian and, and identifying with self-worth because it feels wrong, but it's yeah. not. It's the way that God sees us and learning as a daughter that I can take worth in who I am because He's created me. The same way that I see my daughter, He sees me. And that, yeah. that self-worth is not pride, it's, it's worship. You hit the nail on the head with that because I think for me, I, I didn't wanna feel too lofty or too private or self-centered in any way. And as a worship leader, my job was to get out of the way, I didn't wanna be noticed. Uh, I didn't want to shine because I, I was so afraid of being called private because I had been called certain things and certain word curses over my life when I was a kid. So it's like I was running from those things, but in an effort to run from those things, I, uh, I did not let my light shine. And scripture is so clear about being who God's made you to be and letting your light shine. And it's, it's not uh, to bring glory to yourself, it's to bring glory to Him. And what's great about that too is when you know that you're God's masterpiece, it's not just about you. You know that every single human being is God's masterpiece and they deserve the dignity and, and the honor that we need to give them. And so that's what I was saying about 
you know, smiling at strangers in airports. I would see people who look down or outcast or uh, who seem broken. And I would notice them in a new way when I knew how God felt about me. And what's so lovely about that idea is once you see yourself as God's masterpiece, you start to see everyone else that way too. And you start to see their value and their worth. And it's not just about you. Oh, I'm God's favorite. We're all his favorite. (laughs) So yeah. I think I relate a lot to what Jess said. I I think for most of my life, I've felt either too much, Mm. too much emotion, too many feelings, um, or not enough. Yeah. Not enough grace or kindness or hospitality. And I think I've not even knowing what propels inside of me to try to to achieve perfection somehow. And I didn't ever feel like I really had something beautiful to offer mm. until I had a daughter. I mean, a son too, yeah. but my son came first. And when I had a daughter, I don't want to live in any way that teaches her that she's not beautiful yeah. and wonderful. And, you know, it's like you said, I begun to see how my father sees me, mm-hmm. you know, the way I look at her and my son. And it's been kind of a journey since then. And uh, John Elridge in one of his books just talks about we all have a glory to unveil. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, it's not to lift us up. It's not prideful. It's because when we're living our truest, most purest self in Christ, that we're glorifying Him. And that's when you see those strangers. And you want your eyes to connect with them and the love of Jesus to just be felt. Yeah. And I just feel like he's bringing healing to me through that. But I still have so much in my past that says, you got to earn it. You got to strive. Don't let something drop. Be that for those people. Suppress your needs, you know? And it's just kind of a cycle that I'm still working through, growing in. Those are lies that women, we, we get those lies all the time, don't we? Put your needs last. <laughs> You're too much. You're not enough. If you're a strong leader, you know, you get criticized for it. But if you're, you know, emotional, you get criticized for that. We, we just can't, we can't win, can we? <laughs> and so have you ever thought about where those lies began in your life? Have you tried to trace it back to where they started? Well, that hit home so much when you said that because I know the tendencies and I have some thoughts, but I don't really know what I feel like my parents were great parents. Yeah. I can see my mom struggled to love herself. Mm. I don't know. I, I have some things in my childhood where I got made fun of or said something and was kind of laughed at. Mm. So there's things that I tra- try, but I don't know the deep roots. So when you said yeah. that, that hit home with me. I want to know how to uh, uproot those mm. and bring them to God and l- let Him speak all of that healing into them. Well, I am excited for you because that is why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> From the wreckage And would you take this heart And make it whole again Though the mountains may be moved into the sea And though the ground beneath might crumble and give way I can hear my Father singing over me It's good If I'm honest, maybe I've blamed you too But you would not forsake me Cause only good things come from you Though the mountains may be moved into the sea And though the ground beneath my cross
And though the mountains may be moved into the to come, we'll be walking through this process together of how we overcome lies in order to know who God has made us to be, our truest selves, His masterpieces. I want to introduce you to the first step in the process, a prayer of protection. Would someone like to read Ephesians 6.12? Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So there's a real enemy who doesn't want us to be free. And he's not strong enough to take us out, but if he can get us to believe a lie, we will self-destruct. Our homework for this episode is to create a timeline of our lives. So in order to get to the roots of subconscious beliefs, we have to dig deeply. And most of the time that means looking back and tracing where things started. So what you'll wanna do is Take a sheet of paper or a couple sheets of paper. You don't have to do it exactly how I'm saying. But you're going to fold it into three and use each section to reflect on five-year increments of your life. So like one to five years old, six to ten, and so forth. And what you're going to do is you're going to write down key events, people, situations, anything that stands out to you about that time in your life, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral. And we're going to return to this timeline throughout the process. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. I think when I first started doing this exercise, I felt helpless. I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get beyond this, and I'm never going to get beyond the pain of my history. But trust me, it gets better. Trust the process. So we're going to start by a prayer of protection that I would love to pray over you guys. God, we thank you for the journey we're embarking on, and we pray that you would come alongside us with your Holy Spirit. Protect our hearts in the process. Show us the lies. Show us the lies that you want to dig up and the parts of our hearts you want to speak to and heal. Help us to have the courage to follow you even when it feels uncomfortable, even when it hurts. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. In our next session, we're going to be inviting God to speak to us through our memories and our imagination and connect with our emotions and what they're saying. Sometimes that can be hard. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a stuffer. Uh, I'll be joined by my friend Beth Barkis and a fellow artist, Leanna Crawford. So I'll, I hope you'll continue this journey with us.